going to read from uh, this book real quick it's called the lost history of ancient america our continent was shaped by conquerors influencers and other visitors from across the ocean this is by frank joseph a very famous author and with the, these kind of uh, things um i do want to say though you know he's still coming within you know mesopotamia out of africa kind of mind frame you know when he wrote his books America is a true old world. Why do you think they're finding all these things here? All these so-called influences. This is the old world. I'm going to read this real quick. Very interesting. You guys don't know about it. This is chapter 3. It says here, Egyptian style cat burial in Illinois by Professor Julia Patterson. More than 30 years ago, before highway construction engineers could obliterate a prehistoric burial ground, Archaeologists excavated its 14 earthworks of various sizes. The structures were perched atop a bluff overlooking the Illinois rivers. In the western part of the prairie state, less than 50 miles north of St. Louis, Missouri, the largest dome of configured soil measured 92 feet across and stood 8 feet high as part of the Hopewell Culture Complex some 2,000 years ago. All right. So before this was destroyed, we already know they destroyed many mounds a lot of the architecture a lot of the uh, prehistoric buildings mounds cities this was a common thing the hobo were a mound builder people of far-flung traders and skilled artisans who flourished from circa 600 bc to their extermination of the hands of so-called native american tribes by 400 AD. All right, so that's kind of big. They're saying Native American tribes came and destroyed the whole world culture, the mound builders. Hmm. Now we got to dodge the hijack with their carbon dating and dates. The Illinois site's foremost tomb was found to contain the bones of 22 human adults, evenly laid out in a ring formation around the central sepulcher of a male infant skeleton. All right, you guys hear that and picture that. Nearby, the child carefully interred in its own grave, paws respectfully placed together, were the remains of a bobcat wearing a necklace of drilled, carved bear teeth in the shells of marine animals. All right, look at that, a bobcat. Isn't that the logo of the Shatan clans of the Highland Scottish people? Shatan. They have a bobcat, and they were seafarers. So it's funny that you find this here with shells of marine animals. No other wildcat has been buried by humans in the entire archaeological record. Researchers claim in a study published recently by the Mid-Continental Journal of Archaeology. But this supposedly unique discovery went unrecognized until 2011 when Angela Perry, then a PhD student at Britain's University of Durham, re-examined the bobcat's bones originally misidentified as those of a puppy all right you hear that so they were saying it was a dog but this was a cat they were doing it were they doing it deliberately most likely she and her colleagues surmised that the hopewell had tamed the creature and its revelation is therefore insightful into the human domestication of animals 
perhaps, but the Illinois find might be significant of something else. The interred bobcat was only between four and seven months old when it died of natural causes. There were no cut marks or signs of trauma, writes David Grimm, and signs suggesting that the animal had not been sacrificed. The pomp and circumstance of the burial, she says, suggests this animal had a very special place in the life of these people. Though no other ceremonial interments of the kind have been found in pre-Columbian setting, many hundreds of thousands of ritualized feline graves are known in Egypt, where Bast, the famous cat goddess, was worshipped from at least the late 1st dynasty, 2900 BC, probably during earlier pre-dynastic times. Now that's interesting, Bast, right? This was like a Black Panther female. <laughs> right goddess and we went over that now if you haven't seen my original black panther video wakanda in america video make sure to go check it out we talk about bass in that video and that literally you know that's that's a black jaguar that's that's what's here one of the warrior amazonian queens yeah they dressed up as jaguars too and uh you know that whole thing comes from over here Again, we just saw our video, right? Mammals, the oldest mammals they found was here. We know mammals originated. First ones that came out of the land was in Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania period. We got the oldest water, oldest land, you know. So just put everything together. Again, cats, carnivores, mammals came out of America. These comparisons join a vast body of complementary evidence accumulated on behalf of pharaonic influences at work in pre-Columbian America. That's because ancient Egypt was here. The real Nile is the Mississippi. At very least, they suggest that although the Hopewell were not themselves transplanted Egyptians, they were nonetheless inheritors of a cultural legacies left behind by visitors from the Nile Valley to our continent during prehistory. All right, so that's all conjecture, that part, because again, he's coming with an out-of-Africa background. He wrote this book a while back. Hopefully by now he sees that America is a true world, just like Graham Hancock is realizing. All this is going down right here. Remember, who got corn? Corn is from here. Ancient Egyptians are growing corn. Corn is all over the Bible. Joseph and him storing corn, that was all right here, guys. And we continue. Waking up with analog. Rise and shine. Make sure you check out the brother's Twitter page one underscore analog underscore nine and we begin with a news report coming out of ohio 1902 they found an ancient sepulcher expedition organizing to explore supposed relic of the stone age a remarkable discovery has been made on the shores of prince william sound while a prospector named leeds was out with a party of natives looking for mineral he came to the entrance of a large cave almost concealed from view Leeds entered the cavern and was astonished to find there 14 wooden canoes, each containing mummified corpse. Stone implements were found beside the bodies and stone slabs covered the canoes, everything indicating that the bodies had been placed there during the Stone Age. The find was as big a mystery to the natives as to the white man. Their tribe has been on the shores of Prince William Sound from a period so remote that their traditions do not run back to the time of its advent there. Yet they have had no knowledge of the cave or of the character of people who are interred there. Nor do the present natives use stone implements. Leeds did not disturb the bodies but carefully marked the site of the cave and after prospecting returned to Valdez, an expedition is being organized, headed by Captain Story of the Alaska Packers, association to make a thorough exploration of the cavern and the remains that repose therein all right so i wonder what happened you know in this second expedition maybe somebody told the smithsonian and that's why nobody knows about this what happened and we continue we got a cave found in indiana alaska 1924 cave found in indiana hits age old race indiana giant skeletons and metals strange to america seen an ancient sepulcher indianapolis very first 
Recent discoveries in widely separated localities of the hills of southern Indiana may be expected to add something to the general store of knowledge of natural history. The topography of Indiana is interesting from sand dunes bordering Lake Michigan to the rolling hills which occupy the southern part and in places are but little short of small mountains. In the hills, however, the geologist has found most to interest him as has more recently the archaeologists. The State Museum in Indianapolis is crowded with evidence of a prehistoric past, but with small resources it cannot make the most of the opportunity it might otherwise have of tearing off the veil from long gone ages. The opening of an ancient sepulture built by a race of men antedating the American Indian and probably not related to the mound builders probably they you know they're guessing here has aroused much curiosity this occurred in jennings county 10 miles from north vernon in a bend of a small creek where some excavating was done in a mound built by human hands and reaching a hundred feet in height and about the same in diameter before digging was stopped to await the arrival of more scientific help some interesting things were found continuous as bodies guarded Protected by great stone slabs, skeletons of three men, the longest of which measured much beyond that of modern man, were found. All right, giant people. They showed that infinite care had been taken that the remains be preserved against the ravages of the elements. Metals not common in North America also were found. Although the locality has been settled more than a hundred years, residents near Folsomville in the extreme southwestern part of the state did not know until recently that a cave of mammoth proportions existed close at hand. The discovery was made by a hunter who accidentally stumbled up on the entrance. The cave revealed some things which easily outdo the author of the Arabian Nights and have the added advantage of more veracity perhaps. The most interesting find was of species of blind snakes which hissed so loudly that the Stygian gloom of the earth's innermost recesses becomes all the more hideous. Nestor and some friends succeeded in capturing two specimens alive, and they were sent to the Smithsonian Institution in Washington. Do you see what happened? See who's always involved, right? And you know what they did. They just hit all this stuff. After Nestor and his party had proceeded a distance of 1,500 feet, they came upon a pit which apparently had no bottom. It was sounded to a depth of 2,500 feet. One compartment of the cave was warm and comfortable and another extremely frigid. Nestor, the discoverer, said he believed a race of prehistoric men knew of the cave's presence and made it their home and added its size would accommodate thousands as they dwell in place thousands again living underground right the ant people living underground why what was going on on the surface he found many things to indicate human habitation including arrowheads and stone implements all right we continue this is a good one right here we got a sign coming out of kansas 1896 the newspaper right for colorado ruins a united states marshal describes what he saw there United States Marshal Israel made a number of interesting observations during a recent visit among the ruins of the cliff dwellers in southwestern Colorado. Mr. Israel made the trip to the distant region for the purpose of serving papers from the court in Denver. He found his last man on the border of Utah, Judah, and started on the return journey through the mountainous district that was once the home of a race now extinct. In many places, said Mr. Israel, the cliffs are dotted with little stone houses, built of a kind of stone not found in the neighborhood. The question is, where did the stones come from? And how did the builders lift the stones to their places? I saw one large house which was covered with adobe. This was a surprise to me as I never heard of the cliff dwellers using that kind of material. I was told of a remarkable find in the shape of a stone building 60 feet long and several stories above ground. 
which has also several stories underground. You hear that? The building was described by a man who visited as containing cedar joists 60 feet long. No cedar grows in that country, and it is a mystery how the natives raise heavy logs up the sides of the cliffs. Continue says, Mr. Israel says, the Smithsonian Institution has an agent in the field who is preparing to carry away a large number of relics from their ruins. All right, you guys heard that? You see somebody telling you what I was just saying, what I've been saying in these videos about the Smithsonian Institute. We already know what they do. Everybody who does research into uh, these occult or mysterious things they found here in America, you know that the Smithsonian comes around and things seem to disappear for good from all history. Look at what they're telling you here in this newspaper report. He literally said he wasn't even lying. He was just being honest of what he was experiencing. He was just like Smithsonian agent, an agent, right? Came and what? Carried away a large number of relics from the ruins. A second representation from the East is expected during the summer. So they had more people coming. And within a few years, there will be little of interest in southwestern Colorado for the lover of antiquities. You see what they did? They took it all. The despoilers are at work and the buildings are being torn down and the skeletons and mummies of the original inhabitants are shipped to the museums of the Atlantic states and Europe. All right, body bag, major drop. Hold up, that's a body bag right there. For the illusion, drop nation, yo, con drop. <laughs> Man, I wasn't expecting this, guys. All right, shout out to uh, <laughs> Waking Up With Analog for sharing this with us, finding these great newspaper reports. They're clearly telling you the agenda. Listen to what they were doing. You know, it's not just theories. They were literally destroying the old world structures. We know this, right? Resets and all that. They were, but they were doing it to the ancient ones too, the indigenous ones, the ones that were out of place, that didn't fit their narratives. Remember Manifest Destiny? Look what they were doing. What they were doing, they were at work and the buildings are being torn down and the skeletons and mummies of the original inhabitants are shipped to the museums of the Atlantic states in Europe. The British Museum has Egyptian mummies, right? Oh yeah, what Egypt? America, the true Egypt. Yeah, they're telling you right here, they were doing it, like I was saying. How do we know they weren't shipping all these mummies they're finding in America into Cairo, into Germany, into uh, England, into all these museums all over the world and talking about, oh, it came from Egypt, being all subliminal. They meant the Egypt, yeah, but they meant to marry, a Mary. There is no law in Colorado under which the intruders can be punished. There is no law. You can't go against the Smithsonian, huh? But this is a deep one right here. I hope you guys pay attention to this. First-hand report of what he saw them doing. Again, this was from 1896. By that time, they already had destroyed everything. Imagine. Reconstruction, huh? Or deconstruction. All right, now we're going to read from this book. It's called Unearthed in Ancient America. The Lost Sagas of Conquerors, Castaways, and scoundrels again from frank joseph same author i'm in mean, chapter one says here anomalous artifacts mainstream scholars scoff at the very notion of ancient egyptians sailing to our shores all right so i just want to again remind you that you know this author goes with you know the whole that the old world's on the other side mesopotamia egypt you know the fake fake places so he's finding egyptian stuff here right he knows for sure it's egyptian but of course he's going to add the out of africa theories so mainstream scholars will laugh if you say, well, the ancient Egyptians were here. Yet a ritual grave object could be physical proof of visitors to the American Midwest from the Nile Valley. Nile is right great river in Greek. The Mississippi in the Ojibwe Algonquin word, right, is also means great river. So what are you talking about? Because the Mississippi, you got mounds all over it. Remember Mound City, Cahokia and all this other stuff, all these mounds that got destroyed. All the stuff they're finding in these places, we've already gone over some. All right, so just again, try to stay in the right perspective when we're reading this stuff. This potentially revealing find is described by Wayne May, the founder and publisher of Ancient American 
magazine. I actually called him up. He's a great guy. He sold me some magazines. Going to buy some more. He is also the author of this land, his series of books describing a period in North American prehistory known as Hopewell, from 200 BC to 400 AD. Now it says here, an ancient Egyptian statue found in Illinois by Wayne May. News occasionally surfaces of persons claiming to have uncovered a dynastic Egyptian presence in prehistoric America. Unfortunately, their proofs for pharaonic visitors here are at best theoretically possible or at worst patently erroneous. Far less often a piece of exceptionally persuasive evidence emerges. Such was a statute featured on the front cover of Ancient American 64th issue in 2006. And this is the uh, image right here. All right. You guys can take a look at it. See that? They found that here. They found that here in the real ancient Egypt. They found that here. The Egyptian statuette, allegedly removed from an ancient burial mound in Libertyville, Illinois, little is known of the object's modern origins, save that it was found in Libertyville, Illinois, some 20 miles north of Chicago. During the time of its discovery, in the early part of the 20th century, Libertyville was a sparsely populated agricultural community with only a few dirt roads, in sharp contrast to the sprawl of upper-class suburbia that mostly blankets the area today just off of I-94 tollway. But before World War II, only several dozen families, mostly farmers, were spread over some 12,000 acres of largely pristine prairie. As a young man, the discoverer, whose widow has requested anonymity for her late husband, developed an abiding interest in collecting Indian artifacts, mostly arrowheads, he found in the vicinity of his home. But the richest sources for prehistoric materials were along the banks of the Des Plaines River and nearby Diamond Lake. Otherwise seldom visited, its five-mile shoreline featured a number of Indian burial mounds. He riffled for whatever grave goods might be dug out. These were usually limited to small pipes, spools, bones, flints, and other typical items. From one earthwork, however, he allegedly extracted a most atypical statuette. He never attempted to have his discovery professionally evaluated and showed it to only a few fellow collectors, perhaps for fear of criticism, either for having removed the object without informing the archaeological authorities in Chicago, or because such finds were automatically condemned as the forgeries of conmen trying to defraud money from collectors. Time passed. By the turn of the 21st century, his assemblage of more conventional Native American artifacts reached prodigious proportions. Only then did word of the strange statue reach me, and I, thanks to the generosity of a loyal subscriber, was able to purchase it. The well-crafted object stands nine inches high, weighs approximately half a pound, and appears to have been sculpted from a single piece of off-white soapstone. It portrays a man wrapped in a kind of body stocking from which his emerging hands holds a shepherd crook in the left and a flail in the right. The flail was an agricultural tool used in dynastic times by Nile Valley farmers to separate wheat from chaff by beating stacks of grain on a stone floor for threshing. Pharaohs were commonly depicted in sacred art holding such a device as the emblem of judgment, separating the good from the bad subjects. The shepherd's crook stood for political guidance over his flock, people. The Libertyville figure wears a stylized wig behind the ears, together with a long beard, beginning at the waist and descending to an area corresponding to the ankles are eight lines of hieroglyphic text, with a single additional line composed of four glyphs running top to bottom from the ankles to the unexposed toes. Dr. Thompson's observations demonstrate the possibility, at least, of Egyptian voyagers to North American dynastic times. He was supported by Dr. Barry Fell, another unconventional scholar who uncovered evidence for an ancient Egyptian written language among Native Americans. At Harvard's Widener Library, he, with the help of fellow researcher, located copies of a 300-year-old 
papers composed by a Jesuit missionary in Canada's eastern provinces. The priest had apparently put together a teaching aid for his Mi'kmaq Indian students who copied out the Lord's Prayer in hieroglyphics. On closer examination, about half were recognizable hieratic and simplified form of Egyptian hieroglyphics. More surprisingly, the Mi'kmaq characters corresponded to the meaning of the Egyptian glyphs. Dr. Fell concluded that someone familiar with Egyptian hieroglyphic writing very long ago had contrived the Mi'kmaq writing system of hieratic symbols. All right, do you guys hear that? That's exactly what they found, um, you know, the Mormons, right? That's what Joseph Smith found, these tablets in New York in a cave, and they were of Mi'kmaq, and they had this old Egyptian-type script that they're calling it here. This is what they're talking about. And this was studied by Harvard. This is stuff they never told you. More evidence for Egyptian influence in pre-Columbian America surfaced in the Michigan tablets during the 1840s. Most of these inscribed artifacts display an unfamiliar written script that nonetheless includes several Egyptian hieroglyphs. Again, so-called Egyptian hieroglyphs, right? America's true old world. What's it really called? Tamarian? <laughs> Tamari? Additional examples of Nile Valley effect on prehistoric America came from Burroughs Cave. All right, we're going to get into Burroughs Cave. Don't worry, guys. I know there's major things coming out of there in southern Illinois. I've been following that for years. All right, Burroughs Cave. Of the 7,000 inscribed stones removed from it since 1982, all right, that's the year I was born, few bear traces of Egyptian hieroglyphics, although many do depict persons dressed in Nile Valley garb. Joshua Priest in his book, American Antiquities, Discoveries in the West, all right, we've read his book, was one of the two mid-19th century explorers who documented the rock art illustrations of similarly custom men and women adorning the walls and ceilings of a site known as Cave in Rock State Park, again in southern Illinois. These varied collections of evidence support archaeological probabilities for the Libertyville Ushapti. Similar examples have been found elsewhere in the Americas, according to Mariano Cuevas in his 1922 Historia de la Nación Mexicana, an incident along the line of our inquiry into contact between Mexico and Egypt, which no Americanist can ignore, has been the fortuitous discovery of two statuettes. Their discovery was made a few years ago in August 1914 in a rural parish of His Excellency the Archbishop of San Salvador, the Reverend Father Belloso. All right, again, and this is again another book, another source telling us of the uh, statues they found of Osiris and Isis in El Salvador. We've already done a video about this. Make sure you check it out. If you haven't, we talked about it a little bit in a, one of the recent videos again. And it's going to tell us a here firsthand account of the reverend who actually found it or had it in his possession in, the in 1914. It says, Professor Miguel Angel Gonzalez was conducting precise excavations in the city of Acajutla, in the Maya area near the farthest limit of the railroad line. All right, this is in El Salvador, Central America. These excavations, which were undertaken at the request of the aforementioned archbishop, resulted in the uncovering of two precious artifacts. One has to keep in mind that many similar objects have been encountered by ignorant natives and subsequently ruined. At this same site, according to the Central American historian Garcia Palaez, who was later Archbishop of Guatemala, there existed an antiquity a city that was very grand and important. The most important fact of the statuette is that it represents a sarcophagus or mummy of a male. It gives all the appearances of resembling an Egyptian statuette. If we make closer inspection and focus our attention on the headdress, we notice a typically Egyptian beard beneath the point of the chin. More than anything else, the inscriptions on both statuettes have Egyptian features, such as the classical ellipse or cartouche on the male statuette. We are led to conclude without the slightest doubt that these are Egyptian. They are similar to statues in pictures by Champollion, mark for mark. They have demonic characteristics and hieroglyphics identical to those found on classical Egyptian monuments. All right, so even the hieroglyphics on it is exactly the same. Remember, they found this in El Salvador, which also have analogous ellipses. Because all these characteristics, which are comparable to features of artifacts in the Cairo Museum. Now pay attention, that's what I was saying earlier. 
how do we know a lot of those so-called artifacts in the Cairo Museum didn't come from ancient America when they were coming here with their manifest destiny destroying everything and rewriting history we are able to confirm assertions that we have established a certain Egyptian heritage of these statuettes these Mexican counterparts of the Illinois statue not only tend to support its identification as an ancient Egyptian Ushapti, but also suggests that our continent was indeed visited by travelers from the Nile Valley around 600 BC. All right, so dodge the hijack. This is the Mississippi is the Nile, meaning Great River. That is the Great River. That's a Greek word. Now this is a Greek word, guys. Egypt also is a Greek word. The Temple of Pita, continuing, says here, ancient Egyptian ruins in Colorado, gigantic pillars. It says here, prehistoric city. Lofty walls and gigantic pillars with elaborate carving in Colorado desert. A San Diego, California dispatch says that the ruins of a prehistoric city have been discovered by a party of prospectors from Yuma on the Colorado desert. While in search of the Peg Lake mine, the wind had laid bare the walls and the remains of stone buildings. For a distance of 420 feet in length by 264 feet in width, gigantic pillars quaintly carved to represent dragon heads and rattlesnakes dragon heads and rattlesnakes pillars all right listen to this still stood in the sand of the deserts supporting on their tops huge slabs of granite the frieze ornamentation resembles egyptian sculpture and exhibited a greater degree of skill than is possessed by the indian artisans of the present day Fragments of pottery were found underneath the debris and together with parts of the crumbled pieces of the frieze were brought by the prospectors to this city. Prospector Ferguson called the matter to the attention of H.C. Gordon who interested John F. Gate Jr., a wealthy man of San Diego, and in company with four others, they went to the desert to explore the ruins. They were driven back by a sandstorm they will take another start and make a careful investigation of the ruins. All right, you see how it just always all of a sudden just stops right there and they're going to do more investigation and just they never tell us about this ever. Continuing waking up with analog. A cave deep in the earth, Pennsylvania, 1890. A cave deep in the earth, knives and the remains of a prehistoric race found in it. News comes from Red Cliff, Colorado, of a wonderful discovery made there of a number of relics of some prehistoric race and an, and an ancient sepulcher in the most peculiar place, which it would appear had never been visited by mankind in any age. The men were digging with picks and shovels in virgin soil, when suddenly, as one of the men struck a blow with his pick, it almost flew from his hand, and by the light of their candles, they saw a small aperture in the earth, which was quickly widened sufficiently to admit the body of a man. A light was thrust into the opening, and as far as its rays could reach, only space was discernible, and a musty smell came from the place that had been closed for so long a time, probably ages. A step ladder was procured, and a descent was made to the bottom of the cave, where more surprises awaited the miners, who were now thoroughly aroused over the new sights, the like of which they had never seen before. Superintendent Connors and John Songer pressed forward in the natural opening, and they had worked but a short time before their pick encountered a hard metallic substance in the soft soil. Investigation proved it to be a knife, about 12 inches long, of hardened copper, with an oval handle and a small portion of the point broken off. As their investigations were prosecuted farther, the petrified bones of animals and the remains of men of some prehistoric race were found. The most mysterious part of this wonderful discovery is that it was found in virgin ground, 400 feet beneath the surface, and with no apparent outlet. How it came there is a question that cannot be answered. All right. You see what they're finding here, right? Continue waking up with analog. 
It says here the oldest race. This is coming out of Maine, 1911. It says here the oldest race was the Western Hemisphere, the cradle of civilization. <laughs> we can't make this up, all right? The true old world, you already know. William Nieves, a Mexican herald, over an area of about 3,000 square miles in the Valley of Mexico, from Texcoco to Tlalnopantla. There are hundreds of clay pits from which the material for the adobe native fire bricks and tiles have been made since the conquest and from which have been constructed most of the edifices in the city of Mexico and adjacent towns and villages. These pits have enabled the writer without expensive excavations to make a comprehensive exploration for several years past of the archaeological treasure trove which lies buried below the surface of the entire valley of Mexico, the entire. Recently my efforts have been rewarded by some remarkable and startling discoveries that may open up a new field for archaeological research on this continent. My operations have been chiefly confined to a region of some hundred square miles where I have found two or three concrete floors or pavements ranging in depths from the surface from two to five meters. On the first floor or pavement there is a deposit of pebbles and sand and small boulders covered with rich soil of the valley from two to three meters, in which I found everywhere innumerable fragments of broken pottery, and occasionally small clay figures, diorite beads, sprindled whirls, etc. The second concrete pavement is from three-fourths to one meter beneath the first, but in the intervening space I failed to find a single piece of pottery or anything to indicate that a people had dwelt there. Was the Western Hemisphere the cradle of civilization? It says here, Chicago, December 26. The Daily News, Bloomfield, Kentucky, special of December 25th says, J. A. Allen, of this place, while excavating a foundation for his new gris mill, struck the dome of a cavern of immense proportions, from which a strong current of cold air issued with great force as the workmen made the opening. Torches were procured and Mr. Allen and Mr. Gainbers were lowered down by means of windglass. It was about 60 feet from the surface to the floor of the cave, which they found to be level and sandy, as if were once the bed of an ancient subterranean stream. They followed the main avenue for a distance of over two miles. Alright, so they're in a cave, right? And they walked two miles inside the cave. And it looked like an old stream and discovered an opening and a cliff on the farm of Benjamin Wilson and a well-beaten path was easily discerned that was once trod by human beings. Although it is now in many places covered with forest trees and undergrowth, Mr. Allen and Mr. Gaines of Hearst, after emerging from the cave, started back to town and reported the result of their discoveries. A large party was at once formed which entered the opening of the cliff on the Wilson farm. On one of the main avenues, numerous evidences existed that the place had evidently been the abode of cavemen, as numerous relics were found in the shape of pottery and bronze brick a brac A sepulcher was discovered in a large niche on one avenue at right angles with the main avenue, and in it are numerous mummified bodies. They found how many bodies? right here so many mummies check it out 100 or more being in plain view over 100 mummies in this cave three of the mummies were removed to town where they excite great curiosity i wonder where they ended up and museums that we call british museum the cairo museum things like that think about that the formations in the cave are beautiful beyond description Stately towers of stalagmites, suggestive of grotesque and unique figures, are encountered all along the wonderful subterranean avenue. 
there is a beautiful little lake with water as pure as crystal. And as usual in cave streams, it is full of tiny eyeless fish. The avenues of the cave will measure, in all probability, about seven miles. So that it may fairly be considered another rival to the Mammoth Cave. And certainly one of the great cave wonders of Kentucky, the land of caves, all right? Kentucky, a hundred mummies, a sepulcher, another one here that they didn't tell us about. Continue waking up with analog. We're about to go inside the earth, South Dakota, 1875. Inside the earth, remarkable orifice underneath Ponca, compared to which the mammoth cave is a mere puncture in the ground. One of the fishiest yarns yet printed. All right, do you guys hear that? So you see all the caves we're finding here in the Americas, right? You guys understand? There's a lot of things underneath us too. A lot. We published today an article from the Ponca Journal, which has a decidedly fishy ring. It is all about a gold seeker who found a cave near Ponca and went down into the bowels of the earth 1,500 feet from the surface and there discovered a continuation of the cavern, miles in extent, 800 feet high, and filled with a standing petrified forest besides the petrified forms of prehistoric human beings and animals. If this is all true, Ponca has a fortune in its cave, for the like has never been seen either upon the earth or under the earth. If it is not true, the fellow who found it should be speedily tied up to the cross tree of a telegraph pole. All right, so, well, we know there's many reports of it all over the United States of caves and, and you know, sepulchers and mummies and things they're finding. We already know, so this guy might be telling the truth. Back in the book, The Lost History of Ancient America by Frank Joseph. Chapter 22, Georgia's Ancient City of Shells by Gary C. Daniels. Six hours via driving southeast of Atlanta, seven miles off the Georgia coast, archaeologists have unearthed the remains of an ancient walled city predating the construction of Egypt's pyramids on Sapelo Island, known as the Sapelo Shell Ring Complex. It was an urban site constructed about 2017 B.C., in three districts or neighborhoods, each surrounded by circular walls 20 feet in height and constructed from hundreds of tons of seashells. Some of the earliest pottery ever found in North America was retrieved from the ruined city, which stood in contradiction to local, contemporaneous Native Americans unfamiliar with agriculture, generally regarded by scholars as fundamental prerequisite for civilization. That these simple tribal inhabitants somehow made the leap from hunting and gathering to civilization in a single bound, producing not only a walled city, but also the new technology of pottery, without benefit of agriculture, seems improbable. More likely, a far more advanced people already in the possession of a high culture arrived on the Georgia coast to organize their massive shell rings, but their identity and motivation for settling in Sapelo are unknown. All right, so they don't know who it is, so how can they tell you who it's not, right? drop nation you know so they're always gonna again this arthur keeps thinking with a you know mesopotamia and the true old world's on the other side so that's what he tries to relate when he finds all these things here right those are his opinions but the truth is they did find this ancient seashell monument city with walls and everything here off the coast of georgia at that time acadian summer collapsed in the middle east and dead sea water levels reached their lowest point in China, the Hong San culture collapsed. Sediments from Greenland and Iceland show a cold peak about 2200 BC. The population of Finland decreased by a third between 2400 and 2000 BC. In Turkey's Anatolia region, including the site of ancient Troy, more than 350 archaeological sites show evidence of having been burnt and deserted by the close of the 22nd century BC. Entire regions suddenly reverted to a nomadic way of life after thousands of years of settled agricultural life. In fact, most locations throughout the ancient old world that collapsed before 2100 BC evidence unambiguous signs of natural calamities and or rapid abandonment. What happened then that could have caused such widespread devastation? Answers might come from the sky. Dr Dracons ain't playing, huh? Now, going a little ahead because they start talking about space and all that. It says here, when Hernando de Soto first explored Georgia in 1540, he found it occupied by two indigenous peoples, the Timucua. Indians had migrated there from South America. Remember, we kind of read that in my navigational videos. 
as indicated by their linguistic affinities with native Venezuelans. Did Timucua ancestors flee their homeland after it was devastated by a meteor swarm? Argentina's Rio Cuarto impact craters do date the period in question. The Yuchi Indians believe their forefathers arrived in Georgia after the old moon broke and devastated their island homeland in the Bahamas. The abrupt appearance of a shell ring city at Georgia's Sapelo Island shortly after these catastrophic events tend to confirm Yuchi oral tradition. So I just wanted to quickly read that. I thought it was interesting. You know, this shell city that we never know about it had walls 20 feet high. Come on. Chapter 9. Drowned Village of the Ancient Copper Miners by Wayne and May. 3,200 years ago, Upper Michigan's enigmatic copper miners left behind some 5,000 pits and in excess of 1 million stone tools, but no trace of their towns has ever been found until the discovery of a village site 10 phantoms beneath the surface of Wisconsin Lake. Due to the site's untouched, if presently unguarded condition, its exact position is concealed as some measure of protection. The ruins were found in June 2011 by Scott Mitchum. All right, this guy actually has been finding a lot of things. He's come out in a lot of uh, TV shows, ABC, you know, a lot of things, uh, explaining his discoveries, logs, huge logs being cut, you know, he found in lakes and things like that. He's the owner of the Superior Water Log Company operating in Wisconsin, Canada, and Brazil. Mitchum said, I had never looked in deep water off the island point, but knew the rocky shore gradually sloped down, but previously only covered the first 20 to 30 feet around the island, not in depth. As I got closer, I slowed to an idle and waited until I could see the bottom. I knew I had extra visibility, so I would be able to view greater depths. As the rocky bottom started to appear, something immediately caught my eye, a formation of piled rocks. I got the max, put it on, and dumped my face overboard to see mounds and circles of stone perfectly stacked. All right, here's a picture of it, the grouped rocks right here, as he's saying. I quickly returned to shore, tied up the boat and put on my diving suit. The sun was already down, so I didn't have much time. I swam back to where the boat had been hovering earlier and could faintly make out dark structures lining the bottom in every direction, but declining light conditions terminated my dive. The next day, June 23rd, I arrived back at the site around 2.30 in the afternoon. Conditions were windy, with lots of pollen on the water, so visibility was not the greatest. I put on my scuba gear and dove with a camera in hand. As I swam down to the largest mound, I could see a dark, long pile of rocks, its vicinity littered with hammers and other stone tools, including what appeared to be a wood planter made from some sort of marble-like non-local stone. I logged the site via my global positioning system. All right, so here's uh, one example of what he's talking about. A sunken circle with a small triangular monolith at its center. The same type of three-pointed stones was found inside a Wisconsin earthen mound at Astalan. All right, Astalan, Aslan, a 13th century ceremonial center, less than 200 miles south of Scott Mitchum's underwater find. The significance of these triangle stones is unknown. All right, now imagine, this is at the bottom of Wisconsin Lake. When was this above the water? How long ago was this? Mitchum went on to find what he describes as workbenches used for pounding and grinding. At one of them, two tools were left on top, a hammer and a grinder. The surrounding lake bottom was profuse with stone arrowheads, but an awl and fish hook were made of copper, and other fish hooks he found was much bigger, four-sided, and likewise copper, right, metal stuff here. Mitchum's most remarkable encounter was with a mini pyramid about four feet wide and approximately four feet high. Listen, because all his dives occurred between depths of approximately 30 and 60 feet, the material he found can be dated back from 4,100 to 3,200 years ago when water tables in the upper middle west began to rise from previously lower levels. In other words, the structures and implements he observed were on dry land prior to the 2100 BC after which they were progressively covered by rising waters. This period tends to affirm their identification with the Great Lakes region, ancient copper barons who were busily engaged in large-scale mining operations just then, all right? And they're talking about, yes, there are 
ancient mines, people mining. They don't know who did it. And all this was going to Europe and Asia and all these, you know, what they were getting out of this. It was going all over the world. Because in its present pristine condition, the site is extremely vulnerable to vandalism and theft. It must await the final installation of security systems before its precise location is publicized. Until then, the ancient copper miners' workshop is concealed in a murky darkness that has preserved it for more than 40 centuries. All right, so, all right, when are they going to release this, right? When are they going to protect this? What happened? Continue waking up with analog. A wonderful cave in Iowa. A wonderful cave in Iowa. In the Lead District, within a few miles of the town of Dubuque, is a cave lately discovered which abounds in inexhaustible quantities of rich lead ore. Some of the apartments are beautiful, full of spar and other formations. In one section, the caverns extend to an unknown distance. It has been traveled three miles without any signs of its termination. Three miles, and they had turned around. They're like, hey, this is going too far, guys. Let's turn back. Or without the sight of walls on either side. Compared to this, the Mammoth Cave of Kentucky and other subterranean wonders dwindle into littleness. The American continent, when it shall be fully explored, will be found to contain the most magnificent natural curiosities in the world. Got another wonderful cave, Missouri, 1845. Wonderful cave from the Missouri Statesman. We learned that a most, we learned that a most extraordinary cave has lately been discovered in Howard County in this state. It seems that one of the neighboring farmers, wanting rock for building, commenced digging at this place, and by the sound emitted when struck with a shovel or hoe, he discovered that there was a cavity beneath removing the dirt. He discovered a wall of stone, built evidently by human hands. After displacing this wall, he had free access to the cave, but we subjoined the following account from the statesman. The cave has been explored to the distance of 300 yards, 25 or 30 yards from the entrance is a sort of room, the sides of which, according to an account we see in the Glasgow Pilot, present a most brilliant and wonderful appearance. The writer who entered the cave with a lantern says, I had not proceeded far before I entered the principal chambers that by a single light presented the most magnificent scene that I ever beheld. The ceilings of this splendid cavern is some 18 or 20 feet high and of a hectagon form. The whole ceiling presenting a shining surface as though it was set with diamonds. Continuing, very near the mouth, another writer says, there is a stone shape like a horse, but not so large being only about three feet high. The head neck and the body are entirely finished and part of one hind leg all the rest is solid stone the neck is made of three pieces and stuck or fastened together something like cabinet makers but the corners of drawers together dovetailed the rest is all solid in another part of the cave the walls on one side are very smooth on these walls numerous letters figures and hieroglyphics appear most of which, however, are so defaced as to render them unintelligible. Nevertheless, the figures 1, 2, 6, and 7 are quite plain. Just above these figures, the letters Don and Carlo are legible. Further on, the letters J, H, S appear on the wall. An arm of the main cavern has also been discovered and has been explored some 200 yards. A writer says, the walls and ceilings of this extraordinary cave are pretty much the same as in the other rooms. The walls have a peculiar and extraordinary brilliancy. Occasioned, I discovered from the fact that instead of stone as we first believed, we found them to be of a metal very much resembling sulfate of iron, but more of a silvery appearance. We had not proceeded very far before we heard a rumbling noise that occasionally broke upon our ears a note the most thrilling and melodious I ever heard. We stood for a considerable time in breathless silence to 
catch the most enchanting sounds that ever greeted the ear of man, and it was only at an interval that we could summon and courage to explore its source, which we did, and were much surprised to find it proceeded from a gushing spring in the side of the wall. The sounds we heard we found to be produced by the fill of the water and varied by the current of air before alluded to, which we then found to be very strong. We each took a hearty draught of the limpid water of this gushing spring and after surveying the diamond walls of the greatest natural curiosity in the world, we commenced retracing our steps to its mouth when we found it to be quite dark and eight o'clock at night. All right, so this is what they're finding in all these caves, like a diamond cave, diamond ceilings with a silver metal walls and all that. Wow. Possible Dracon here coming out of Wyoming. It says here, a skeleton of an animal, 314 feet long. This is from 1907. All right. It says here, largest fossilized remains ever discovered on exhibition in Wyoming. Bags, Wyoming, July 25th. The most important paleontologist discovery ever made in the great fossil beds of Wyoming has just come to light in the fossilized skeleton of an animal of the lizard type, all right, Dracon, which shows a length of 314 feet and which weighed during life more than 100,000 pounds. It is far and away the largest skeleton of any prehistoric animal yet discovered, all right? So I just want to emphasize if you really think about it, a lot of these dinosaur and fossils found, they're like in America, right? The true old world. The remains were found by an expedition from the Wyoming State University and are in a perfect state of preservation. Every bone seeming to have been in place when petrification set in. The great skeleton in the side of a hill has not been entirely detached from the stone in which it is embedded. However, the entire length can be seen. One vertebrate which has been removed weighed more than a thousand pounds when brought here. The skeleton will be taken from the earth and placed in the Wyoming State University, which has the greatest collection of prehistoric animal fossilizations in the world. All right. So yeah, and what happened? Because you know, they'd be like finding little tooths here and there or a little claw, a nail, and then they build a whole dinosaur off of that. Because dinosaurs, a lot of them, they're not real, the one they show us. What is this? What is this really? 